Thank you. And welcome, everyone, to uh, this session on rural drug court treatment issues. We have a tremendous number of people that have shown interest in this. We have probably over 250 that are participating from about 20, over 20 states and abroad. We know Jamaica and, Can and Canada are participating and a few other representatives from other countries as well. So we're, we're obviously addressing some very common issues. Um, Men, some, a number of you have sent in questions with, in the, with your registration, which we hope to answer. If the others have questions during the course of the session, please just indicate them, and we're going to try to answer as many as we can during the session uh, in the question and answer period, and we will follow up with those that we don't, aren't able to answer. Uh, this webinar will also be archived so that you and your colleagues can access it after the session. We are also going to talk at the end of the session about a listserv that we're going to develop so that we can have continuing information exchange and perhaps other web meetings if, it's, if there's interest. So we'll, we'll tell you about that. And Jeff Kushner, who's really put this whole thing together, is going to oversee that. So without any further delay, I want to introduce uh, our panelists. And we have uh, representatives from four different states. I want to start with Judge Catherine Bittigary. Um, from Sydney, Montana. Judge Vitigary? Good afternoon. Um, I, I come, I guess, onto this panel as somebody who lives in a very rural part of Montana that by federal standards is considered to be frontier. And in that very rural setting, we have a five-county program on three different levels. We have a youth treatment court, we have an adult treatment court, and then we have a DUI treatment court. And so that, that basically is the background from which I come to the panel. Thank you. And Judge Britt? Judge yes, I'm Britt. Philip Britt. Yes, I'm Philip Britt. I'm the uh, drug court commissioner, which is uh, in Missouri a uh, judicial, special jurisdiction judicial position which handles just treatment court. Uh, I live in the extreme southeast corner of Missouri, what we commonly call the Missouri boot heel. Uh, it's that part that looks like it should be in Arkansas, but still we're in Missouri. Uh, I have uh, two adult criminal courts, two DWI courts uh, in separate counties, uh, one family treatment court and a regional veterans treatment court, which uh, covers uh, up, to, up to 23 counties. We have currently have participants from 18 counties uh, in that Veterans Treatment Court. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn Kessner? Hi, I'm Marilyn Kessner, and I'm Idaho's first district problem solving court manager. I'm responsible for program development for the specialty courts within the district. I became involved with drug court as a felony probation officer with a caseload that included drug court participants and then as a coordinator. Thanks, it's nice to be here. Thank you. And Jeff, probably everyone knows Jeff, but Jeff, can you give us a little background on your perspective? Sure. I'm, this, I'm the statewide drug court coordinator in Montana. Uh, I was previously with the St. Louis Drug Court, St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, have been a statewide drug court or a statewide alcohol and, and uh, drug single state agency director in three rural states, uh, Montana, Colorado, and uh, Oregon. Okay. And Angie? Hello, everyone. I'm the statewide drug court coordinator for Missouri, and I provide technical assistance and oversight for our 135 treatment court program. Thank you. And as you can see, just about everyone in this panel covers multiple locations, which has been a big issue that I know many, many of you have encountered. Okay, I just want to make one reference to uh, the treatment guide that we have in draft form. I hope everyone has gotten a copy of it because we would welcome any additional comments or uh, uh, suggestions you have for this. We're going to be publishing it next um, next month. And it's a technical assistance guide for drug court judges and drug court treatment services. And it's really for everyone, but we were really doing this as kind of a guide for judges who just are assigned to the drug court so they can get a perspective on what drug court treatment services entail. Okay, I would um, now like to turn, uh, well, this is our agenda. 
before, um, you may have seen this already, but we're going to address 10 challenges that we've identified that are covered in that guide. There's a, the guide has a substantial chapter on rural issues, challenges, and solutions that programs have, um, have developed. Okay, I would now like to turn this over to Jeff. And Jeff, if you can now start our, our webinar with our panelists. Thank you, Caroline. We appreciate it. Um, I'm uh, really pleased to have so many people uh, attending. It's great. Uh, I don't know why we didn't do this before now, but we didn't. And thanks to Caroline Cooper at AU and to the Department of Justice and Tim Jeffries for um, starting a, a focus in this area. You know, it's uh, long been considered that alcohol and other drug abuse has kind of been an inner city problem. And uh, that uh, is really no longer true. When you look at the surveys that have been done on prevalence of alcohol and other drug abuse, there clearly has been a convergence uh, into uh, rural areas. And uh, at this point, uh, you know, alcohol has always been a primary problem in, in rural areas. But now we're seeing um, illicit drugs having infiltrated almost all of uh, our communities. And so adults and young teens in rural areas are just as likely to abuse alcohol and other drugs as they are in metropolitan areas. And so as we recognize this equality, it's critical that we come together, we look at the challenges, and we work on the solutions to improve the delivery uh, in rural areas of our country. Um, our agenda for today includes those 10 challenges. Uh, we, as panelists, do not claim to have all the answers. In fact, we're hoping that a lot of you uh, will provide us with some of the answers to these um, critical issues that we have. Um, but we do think that, uh, that we can start to uh, mount a response to them and uh, hope that you'll join us. We want to be highly interactive and look forward to your comments as well as we hope you look forward to ours. Um, I think uh, that pretty well does it. We'll, uh, again, we'll try to have a listserv afterwards because I know we're not going to get to all the questions uh, that we have. Um, so hopefully you'll join us after this webinar and, uh, and provide uh, challenges and solutions as well. Our first challenge is the lack of treatment capacity access to a full continuum of treatment services in rural areas. And I'll ask uh, Judge Bittigary to start that discussion. Thank you, Jeff. This is Catherine Bittigary. Um, of course, in rural settings, we treatment capacity is something that I think every one of us finds to be a challenge. And however, greater minds than mine who have considered this problem and this challenge have identified different kinds of various possible solutions. Most geographic areas of the country have some type of alcohol or other drug abuse treatment program that contracts with a single state agency for drug abuse prevention and treatment. Those single state agencies receive federal block grant funds and in many cases, state general funds and sometimes alcohol tax funds to prevent and provide treatment programs. So among the things that those of us who are faced with the challenge of a lack of treatment capacity that we can do is to contact our local legislators to accompany us to meet with the single state agency director in our state and inquire why there is little or no service available in our particular area and engage in a discussion as to the different kinds of solutions that may be available to address that problem. Research supports and drug courts often identify a single treatment provider and thus they're able to focus resources into training and acquisition of knowledge specifically about the drug court model and other evidence-based practices. Some rural drug courts have linked up with qualified providers who may be distant but who are willing to contract with that particular drug court to provide services using Skype or teleconferencing, video conferencing, emails, messaging, 
either by text or chat and telephone. So th anyway, this kind of linking t allows a drug court provider to offer intensive outpatient services with supplemental teleconferencing. And I know that inpatient out intensive outpatient treatment is something that many of us living in the very rural parts of the country do not have readily available to us. And so this other option of linking by video conferencing or other means is certainly one option that could address that void. Outpatient detoxification is another very difficult um, void to fill in rural settings. Most hospitals do not want to take on the responsibility of, of that, at least in the rural places like where I live. And so they are, however, if you can get the right treatment providers within that facility to be on board for the importance of providing the service, might be able to provide some sort of home health nurse management with consultation with a physician to assist with detox. Um, that covers part of the first issue on this lack of access. I'll turn it over to Judge Britt to add anything he wants to add to that and then to go on to the second issue that we've identified as fitting into lack of access. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Philip Britt again. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of things to um, what Judge Pittigary had mentioned, and and one of those deals with the single state agency, and uh, in, at least in Missouri, the Division of Behavioral Health handles all the alcohol and drug abuse uh, funding for the state. Uh, one of the things that we have tried to do in Missouri is is have a presence within that organization. They have a statewide uh, advisory council, uh, and I have encouraged, uh, and we've we've always had at least one or two members of that advisory council who came from the drug court community. That gives us a really good opportunity to, to have some contact with, with, with drug and alcohol um, prevention and treatment across the board, uh, as well as having input in how that money is spent. Um, a second, we found that uh, with drug court funding comes uh, treatment. The money is available. Treatment will find a way to provide service in your area. Uh, so utilizing our stories and our uh, research to convince the legislature that funding needs to be appropriated in, in rural uh, America for drug treatment is very important. Uh, one way, though, that, that has been very interesting in Missouri is not to go to <clears throat> bring the people to uh, treatment, but to actually bring treatment to them in a very interesting way. And uh, Angie Plunkett's going to share what's happened in one particular instance in Missouri. Thank you, Commissioner Britt. Uh, we've been very fortunate in Missouri. We have a, a treatment vendor, Preferred Family Health Care, who started a program called Virtual World Counseling back in 2008. And in 2011, we started pilot projects with our drug courts here in Missouri. Uh, virtual counseling is a 3D virtual world. It's similar to Second Life or a video game that you would play. And they use animated avatars that correspond by chat in both group and individual settings. It does require that a participant has a laptop computer and access to the Internet. Uh, Preferred Family Health Care received a federal grant to assist with the implementation of this project, which included funding for laptops for each participant. So similar to traditional in-person treatment, virtual counseling occurs at regularly scheduled times, and it uses the same evidence-based practices that you would see on a face-to-face -face treatment session. Now, Skype was used to ensure the identity of participants. Uh, this removes barriers such as geography, transportation issues, uh, lack of driver's license, child care issues, and it's used as a supplement to traditional or in-person treatment. So it's not the only treatment they're getting. It's, it's something that's a supplement. So I think the last slide you saw was a, a group session. The slide you're seeing now is an individual session. And you can see to the right there the chat between the counselor and the participant. Uh, virtual uh, preferred family health care has reported that their participants are quicker to open up. 
they're more open in sessions, and they're not as afraid of being stigmatized by a, a drug offender during their group session. We've also found that this is very um, effective with emerging adults who typically have poor outcomes than older individuals. And if you move to the next slide, we've implemented this program in four judicial circuits in Missouri, but uh, we've contacted the vendor and they plan to bid on this statewide so we can have it accessible to everyone in the state. Our own research section has performed a study and found that uh, this type of counseling is just as, um, just as effective as regular face-to-face uh, sessions. We have a few issues with this, set, with this program. A few participants were unable to access the internet from their home, so a public use computer was set up in the courthouse for those participants. Uh, we found that additional computer and internet training was needed for older participants. And if you're going to implement this in your state, um, you can contact me, I can help you out with that, but we, there's protocol, confidentiality, treatment plans, and equipment requirements that need to be set up. Okay, very, thank you, uh, Angela, that's uh, quite interesting. We're also working on, we've got uh, equipment, video teleconferencing equipment in every courthouse in the state of Montana, and we're also working with, uh, going to start working with the court uh, uh, for innovation out of uh, New York to see if we can supplement our outpatient counseling to get to an IOP level by using the equipment in each of our district and in some of our district uh, courts across the state and in our more rural areas. Um, our second issue is a lack of access to adequate wraparound services for drug court participants and here are some suggestions. Most states have, uh, even in rural areas, <laughs> job training centers or employment agency offices, as well as vocational rehabilitation offices nearby. And we've been somewhat successful uh, in asking them to assign a single point of contact for the drug court for consistency. And then we ask that person to come to drug court and to be part of, uh, to participate in staffing, see how uh, staffing occurs, um, come and uh, view a docket as well as a graduation. And so we can explain then how drug court works and can help them achieve their performance objectives of uh, completion of training programs and completion of employment placements. Um, this. I think brings about a, a much better buy-in uh, on the part of individuals that have these auxiliary services for a drug court, and uh, especially if they come to a graduation, they, uh, I think, are much more prone to buy into what we're trying to do and help us uh, uh, much more extensively. Uh, another option is to look at faith-based organizations who also have a history of reaching out and aiding individuals and families in need. And these organizations often are willing to fill some service gaps uh, as well. Uh, some of the faith-based organizations often support a variety of services that are available to drug court participants in need, including things like rental assistance money, uh, emergency housing support, food and clothing banks, transportation assistance, uh, conflict resolution, free lunch programs, free medical clinics, uh, yard work assistance, elderly assistance, daycare assistance. Uh, a lot of faith-based organizations and churches have 12-step meetings in their facilities and are more than willing to assist uh, recover, uh, clients in recovery uh, with um, uh, things like child care. So uh, those are some suggestions um, that uh, uh, hopefully uh, will work in your uh, rural community. Um, and I would ask other panelists if they have any other uh, comments that they'd like to make at this point. All right, we'll move on to our next issue in the wraparound service area, which is a lack of alcohol and drug-free housing. And I'll ask Marilyn to take the lead here. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next issue really addresses the basic need and that many rural communities lack that safe and affordable rental housing. Strengthening community support and direct relationships with landlords is helpful, 
Landlords are often willing to prioritize renting to drug court participants once they understand the requirements and intense supervision of the drug court process. With the challenges of attaining safe and sober housing for participants in the specialty courts, creative ideas must be entertained. Lack of funding and the not in my backyard syndrome always finds its way into the problem of the problem solving discussion. Many drug court coordinators within our state have gone out and created a generic type letter for participants to present to potential landlords. In this letter, it outlines the program duration of the program, intensity, supervision, the treatment that it's involved, that they're supported from a team of professionals, and also the drug and alcohol testing. Within the letter, goals of the program are identified to integrate participants in the community and empower clients with life skills. This type of generic letter has also been very successful for seeking employment. One of our community leaders has a vision for a responsible renters program. Most of the, our participants are high risk renters and the goal of this program would be to educate participants about what a responsible renter looks like. What are the expectations of a renter from the landlord? Stress the importance of paying one's bills on time. Conduct periodic inspections of the home. Ensure that those that are on the lease are the only inhabitants. Ideally, um, the participants would be paired up with an advocate mentor who would assist them through the process and continue engagement with them. Initiating dialogue with potential landlords about renters programs may entice them to take a risk with a population they've been hesitant to deal with. In Idaho's second district, coordinators have gone out to the community and presented pamphlets to various motels explaining the drug court program in this case of Veterans Court. They've engaged in dialogue with the manager and asked if they would be willing to provide free or reduced rate rooms for vets being released from jail and transitioning to residential treatment. We found that really educating the community and sharing needs is that start. The next, the next slide that we're looking at here pertains to transportation. And that's for participants and seems to be a struggle for so many that lack either the transportation vehicle themselves or, or a license. And requesting bicycles from local law enforcement that are left unclaimed, asking churches if they could help out with vans or buses, strong 12-step networks of drug court and alumni can help as well. For participants with Medicaid, often states pay for transportation to medical appointments, including counseling, which can be scheduled in conjunction with court appearances. One district uses mentors to offer rides to participants. In Oswego County in New York, local officials contracted with a local taxi company to provide transportation. One of our tribes purchased a van bus for drug court participants. In another drug court, the judge decided to hold court in a location that was more convenient to participants rather than always in the designated courthouse. Within Bonner County, our four small towns combined their efforts to establish a free bus system. One town secured a grant which opened up dialogue among the adjoining communities. Collectively, a limited bus service was established which moves people to strategic places within the communities. Unfortunately, this still leaves many of our participants who live outside the more populated areas with transportation issues. However, successful operation of this little bus system attests to the power of communities coming together to solve problems. Another solution may be meeting with county coalitions if they exist in your communities. This can initiate dialogue about the transportation needs of participants in the community. For example, if there's a Meals on Wheels program, could logistics be coordinated to bring individuals into town for treatment or meetings from volunteers serving in that program? When funding is limited or non-existent, creativity and collaboration with other local agencies frequently becomes our only resource. I'd like to go ahead and turn this over now to Angela Plunkett. State Drug Court Coordinator for Missouri to address lack of access to medical and dental services. Thank you, 
Marilyn. Our next issue is the lack of access to medical and dental services often needed by our participants. If your state has a dental school or free clinics can be set up in remote areas using dental students, federally qualified health care centers are intended for underserved areas and can be of significant benefit to rural drug court participants. In many areas, physicians or dentists will provide pro bono services at a reduced or Medicaid rate. Uh, one drug court we talked to steered participants to a local dentist who sees disadvantaged clients for free on a specific day each month. One other district included a dentist as a mentor who was a recovering alcoholic. He provided services for a minimum cost. In Idaho, one drug court has a doctor on their drug court team who also facilitates medical services for drug court participants. I know in Missouri, a few of our rural drug courts have partnered with the local county health department for free physicals, uh, hepatitis A and B shots, testing for TB, HIV, and STDs, along with education programs for participants through the American Liver Foundation. Back to Great. Jeff. Yes. Great, thank you, Angela. Uh, I guess I would ask the panelists uh, if anybody uh, has uh, additional comments regarding housing, transportation, or uh, medical services uh, before we go any further. All right, not hearing any. Uh, the one thing I did want to mention is that from the standpoint of housing, Oxford houses have been particularly successful all across the country and in rural areas as well. And usually the single state agency uh, can help you uh, access um, Oxford House technical assistance. And uh, it's a good uh, uh, method for people in recovery to live in a, in a uh, environment where uh, it's alcohol and drug free. So we'll move on to um, our next challenge which is a lack of access to adequate wraparound services for parenting classes and child care services. Um, they often, uh, uh, extension divisions, agricultural extension divisions at the county level, uh, often offer parenting classes and parent education courses. And so this is a resource that's often overlooked that can provide some help to education of our drug court clients, our drug court participants. So you might want to consider accessing your local extension division. Uh, treatment providers also deliver classes uh, regarding uh, uh, best parenting practices. You may have a local YWCA. They often provide classes as well. I mentioned before faith-based organizations. There may be a domestic violence shelter or a foster care organization that may have resources as well. Regarding child care, the same resources um, might be able to provide some resources in this area. Often 12-step meetings, again, are held in churches, and the churches are willing to provide some daycare uh, while that's going on in their facility. Uh, panelists have anything they'd like to add to that? All right, we'll go on. Our next area of challenge relates to the inability of drug court and treatment providers to hire qualified staff and avoid turnover. Uh, Judge Bidegary, would you uh, like to start the comment here? I would. I am going to add one thing to the last slide, I guess. That, and in our very rural area, we had no parenting classes or nothing consistent available. And one of the things that we did for our five county area that encompasses 10,000 square miles was to get together uh, representatives from treatment providers, the schools, from family services and youth court probation and the courts to discuss options for providing the parenting classes. We were able to apply for a grant to buy an, an evidence-based parenting class program and to get some people trained to facilitate the teaching of the program and we're able then to implement some parenting classes throughout the five county district. So sometimes the things that you don't think about yourself by tapping into some of the other stakeholders, you might be able to at least have, show 
broad-based support for the grant funds and, and be successful in obtaining some funding to get a program in place. Then, now I'll turn to the one that I really was supposed to be talking to at this point, which is uh, the challenge of inability of drug court treatment providers to hire qualified staff and avoid excessive turnover. That is a huge problem in really rural places. It's hard to attract sometimes qualified people to apply for the positions that are available in rural settings. and. Oftentimes, it's really difficult, especially to attract younger people to come to those places because they prefer maybe the amenities to more populated areas. Some suggestions, however, to um, assist in hiring qualified staff and avoid turnover that others have considered are to request assistance from the single state agency for substance abuse prevention and treatment in the state and to ask that the agency be invested in expanding treatment opportunities in our under-resourced rural areas. To make agencies um, you know, assist with that, there need to be some sort of incentives, um, incentives particularly to establish satellite offices and invest in workforce development. With regard to workforce development, one approach is to emphasize the use of evidence-based manualized treatment approaches that can be easily trained and used by less experienced and sophisticated counselors. And I can speak to that at least with regard to the parenting problem that we kind of solved in that same fashion, that it does work. I mean, these evidence-based programs, whether it be for parenting, whether it be for treatment, are well designed and really um, remove many of the obstacles to having uh, less experienced people be able actually to relate the important information. Some uh, locales have considered partnering with local community colleges to assist in the development of qualified counselors and also to provide internships in local treatment agencies and to the drug court in particular. Sometimes providing treatment services using telehealth technologies may be helpful to address workforce issues. Telehealth has been used to create access to existing workforce problems um, or to, to address workforce deficits. Also, drug courts may wish to develop partnerships with the VA because the VA is the largest provider of telemental health services that we have. Some drug court clients may already be receiving VA services, and drug treatment services are just one more service that the VA is equipped to provide. Treatment compliance and related, isu related issues can then be shared with the drug court team. And with that, I guess I'll turn it over to see if there are any other panelists who wish to add anything on this topic of the inability of drug courts and treatment providers to hire qualified staff or avoid excessive turnover. This is Philip Britt. Uh, one of the things that I would like to uh, to mention is it's hard for us to to avoid that excessive turnover or to avoid turnover. The important thing for us to remember and for us to encourage and insist upon uh, as drug court professionals is that when there is turnover, that those new individuals are immediately trained in the, in, in the drug court model and in exactly what, uh, what are our expectations of them uh, as they deal with participants in our treatment courts. Uh, I think that's very important for us to, to remember. Uh, this is Jeff Kushner. Uh, another thing that has uh, helped in some of our rural areas is to make sure that the supervisor of the uh, outpatient counselor that's uh, working in a rural area is well aware of drug court and uh, how drug court works so that if there is some turnover, sometimes the supervisor uh, can uh, can fill in while they're looking for you know, another counselor to take the place of the one that, uh, that left. So uh, just the thought to keep the supervisors involved in your drug court as well. Um, Judge Bidegary, would you 
talk a little bit about uh, the inconsistency of provider services from the standpoint of maybe a memorandum of agreement? Certainly. One way that um, w one way to maybe avoid inconsistent provider services and enhance the likelihood that you've got evidence-based consistent service is to enter into a memorandum of agreement with the treatment provider. And in that memorandum of agreement, set out the standards that you expect that provider to uh, meet, being very clear as to all of the fundamental needs uh, of the program and keeping in mind that that um, you know any program any drug court program has to abide by the 10 key components and that you need to have service that is actually meaningful a memorandum of agreement provides a foundation for consistency and coupled with an initial meeting of the drug court team and the treatment court provider to review the stipulations in the memorandum of agreement you can answer then any questions and make sure that everybody's on the same page about what exactly that memorandum of agreement ex requires on both sides. Uh, that agreement is something that you should not enter into and then forget about. It's something that someone needs to be vested with the responsibility of reviewing um, on a regular basis and it's something that the provider then should be required to report about at least on a quarterly basis to inform the treatment court of how that treatment provider has met the expectations outlined in the memorandum of agreement and 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 what maybe what difficulties or challenges that treatment provider encountered in meeting the outlined uh, requirements of the memorandum of agreement the report that the treatment provider um, presents to the treatment court is something that should be reviewed in meetings outside of the staffing of the docket. And so I think it's important to set aside specific time to tend to some of these key parts of what make the program function well when you're not rushed and when everyone who has a stake in that particular component of the program, such as treatment, has an opportunity to weigh in and address deficiencies if there are some. Uh, some of the requirements that, I'm sorry, was that, I, I don't remember if somebody else was going to be speaking to this or if it's just me. No, and that's fine. Continue. Keep, okay. No, that's fine. Go some ahead. Some of the requirements to include in a memorandum of understanding so that consistency is enhanced is to designate a therapist who will be the one to work with drug court participants. Um, having one person within an agency be mainly the one sort of designated to be the treatment court treatment provider really goes a long ways toward maintaining consistency, partly because it's easy to maintain lines of communication with that person and to make sure that that person receives all of the necessary education about how the treatment court model operates and what's expected from the treatment component. Um, it's critical that there be regular communication between the therapist and the court. Um, those methods of communication can include written and verbal reports from the treatment provider at each staffing. Those written or verbal reports that the provider does give the court at staffings at a minimum should cover attendance. It's important that everyone on the treatment court team have good understanding whether the drug court participant has been attending treatment appointments, and if not, when they missed, and it, why they missed. In addition to attendance, those reports should address progress notes, including the level of participation and completion of assignments. Progress would in addressing what progress a participant has made, the treatment provider would, I guess, address whether that participant is moving forward in achieving identified treatment goals and objectives, um, a summary of what material has been covered in treatment with that participant, all of which enable the judge at the court session to ask the participant open-ended questions that engage that participant and um, make the participant think um, 
along the lines of what motivational interviewing is, is intended to do. So basically, having these appropriate progress reports assists the judge in effectively engaging in motivational interviewing. Besides attendance and progress notes, the reports from the treatment provider should also include any recommendations that the treatment provider might have to improve the progress of treatment for a particular participant, whatever concerns the treatment provider might have about the participant and the participant's ability to improve progress, what sanctions might be warranted, and what recognition the provider thinks is appropriate, like well, should, should this participant move to the next phase? Should this participant be uh, recommended for chairing a self-help meeting? Um, has this participant engaged in extraordinary um, progress in, in treatment? So key to have communication with the treatment provider and to have at least the fundamental issues of attendance, progress notes, and recommendations included in the report that the provider gives to the court. With Great. that, I guess Thank I you. turn to the other panelists. All right. Are there other comments from other panelists? The uh, only comment I would make is that I, I always try to have my treatment provider prioritize drug court clients and uh, and be as responsive as they can to them. And the re and well, part of the rationale for that is that all of these treatment providers that participate in block grant funds, and almost all of them get some level of block grant funds from SAMHSA, is that there are what are called national outcome measures that all of these programs are expected to uh, meet, and those include things like uh, treatment completion percentages, reductions in drug use, uh, employment improvement, academic improvement of the participants while they're in treatment. And those are all things that drug court wants to have done as well. And so we focus on those, and we, are, we can be critical to helping a treatment provider meet their national outcome measures. It doesn't hurt to point that out, I think. All right, we're going to move along because we're running a little behind. Challenge five, uh, which is not necessarily a problem only in rural areas, but may be a little more difficult to overcome in rural areas, and that's when the participant is caught up in family drug use and can't get away from that environment. So Marilyn, would you uh, lead the discussion here? Absolutely. Um, in addressing that, uh, sometimes caught up in that, that whole family dynamic, a direct response to the situation would be to uh, do an intervention with the family and try to move them into treatment. Um, just trying to stress to them how important the whole family system is to the success of the participant. Um, if the immediate family will not consider supporting the drug court participant by entering treatment and not using, consideration might be given to finding alternative living arrangements, um, developing a plan with drug court participant, how he or she will, will handle that, much like a, a relapse uh, prevention plan. Consideration could also be given to transforming the individual to another drug court or transferring them um, if that is all um, feasible to be done. The participant could also be referred to Al-Anon, a companion program to AA that focuses on dealing with codependency by learning new behaviors and boundaries, especially with these intimate relationships. Oftentimes, family members out of not, not understanding just enable that individual. Enmeshment in uh, family drug use may be compounded, too, by what we see quite a bit in our, um, unfortunately, in our northern Idaho area is generational poverty which is often present. The culture of poverty has its own set of ideals and values, such as the reliance upon family members, that fatalistic thinking and lack of delayed gratification. The perception of, of drug addiction does vary, and, and sometimes for a parent, perhaps, who is abusing prescribed pain medication for a chronic condition may not even be viewed as a drug addict. However, the effects of the addiction are evident within the family system. Including the family in the recovery process through education, extending treatment to family members, and providing resources such as circles to address poverty is part of a holistic treatment approach not only for the individual but the family as well. Meeting clients and family members where they're at is, is crucial. Establishing curriculum that addresses basic life skills is a beginning. In Bonner County, we're very, very fortunate to have a treatment provider that encourages families to participate in the recovery 
by incorporating education, um, inviting them to participate in family and marriage counseling, um, which is part of their treatment plan. Jeff, if I may comment, I wanted to appreciate you so much your, your slides, and in the upper left-hand corner, I'd like to bring your attention to those silos. And I was had the opportunity to meet with quite a few community uh, participants looking at some different uh, models for juvenile drug courts. And in that dialogue, we realized that there are all of these agencies that come to the table and we are all perhaps working with this individual, but we're all working in silos. We're working individually, um, addressing probably the same issues. And I, I would really like to share and stress the importance of collaborating and working together within that community, working with all the professionals that are looking at the success of the individual, as well as educating, getting out and educating people in the community um, one of the beautiful things about being in a rural community is just that it's small, we can have connectivity, we can have closer relationships, and, and by doing this and creating that relationship with our, with our clients, I think we're also going to find that they will be successful as well as our communities. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, are there other comments that uh, panelists would like to make in this area? Okay, one, one thing I would mention is that in Montana, we have developed, along with Children and Family Futures out of Anaheim, California, uh, a, a, an instrument called the Family Strength and Needs Survey. And uh, this is a, 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 an instrument that was developed primarily for adult drug courts to use because what the research says, if you don't work with the family, you're going to be less successful with the primary person that's in treatment. And so some of our drug courts wanted to have an instrument that would help them assess what's going on with the family, uh, both strength and needs-wise. And so uh, we've, uh, for about a year, worked on this piece it, uh, um, with uh, Dr. Greg Robinson at Children and Family Futures. It's in the public domain. Uh, anybody is more than welcome to use it. Um, it's quite comprehensive and uh, does a great job. And a lot of our drug court coordinators indicate that it really helps them establish rapport with the rest of the family and helps them to get the services that they need, which then builds the confidence uh, in that family in what we're doing and uh, I think helps prepare the family to participate better in the, in the overall drug court process. So. Uh, if you're interested in the Family Strength and Needs Survey, uh, drop me a line. I'd be glad to share it with you or, or contact Children and Family Futures. Um, let's see. Our next challenge uh, is rural specific in that it relates to the inability of the judge and the drug court team to cover vast rural areas and hold the necessary frequent status hearings and generally monitor the participant. So I'll ask Judge Britt, I think, to start on this one, and then Judge Vitagari, I'm sure, will uh, want to comment as well. Judge? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, one of the very important things that we've dealt with in, in drug courts for years is, is how often we, uh, we meet with participants and how often they come to court for court appearances uh, in an attempt to hold them accountable. It's very important that the judicial relationship with the participant is extremely important. We know that. We've seen that from the research. However, uh, in many areas in rural, rural America, uh, it's, it's impractical for us to meet on a weekly basis with our participants. Uh, and in fact, the research has shown uh, that a minimum of every other week uh, is, is recommended. So, we don't feel as compelled uh, with the, the current research as we, we felt before that we should meet every week with our participants. Um, we, we need to make sure that we have uh, a real strong staff that can work well with the individual so that uh, even though they're not coming to court on a weekly basis, they're still getting the kind of supervision and the kind of, of uh, staff intervention and contact that they need. Uh, some rural states have, are now implementing uh, video conferencing or uh, I know in Missouri every courthouse in Missouri has 
uh, a, a is part of a statewide system uh, for telecommunicating between those courthouses. Uh, and in some places, they've been able to facilitate uh, hearings between the judge and the and the team for staffing, as well as with participants. Um, it could be an option for courts that have to cover a, a large area. I like Judge Pettigary, so if you want to take that over and kind of talk about that, Judge, I would appreciate it. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I live in a real, very rural part of northeastern Montana that's considered to be frontier by federal standards. The judicial district over which I preside has five counties covering approximately 10,000 square miles. A little over 10 years ago, the state of Montana, through it, the Office of Court Administrator, um, wisely approached our legislature for funding to start putting into each of the courthouses video conferencing equipment. And over the course of time, most of the 56 counties in Montana, plus many other places, including some jails and the state hospital and public defender's offices, now have that same video conferencing equipment available. My first treatment court uh, was implemented in 2006, and from the very beginning, the manner in which we conducted our um, staffings and our dockets was by video conferencing. Of the five counties, there are two that have the bulk of the population within the judicial district, and so we basically made team members congregate at those two locations and by video conducted our staffings. In the same fashion, we conducted our dockets. And uh, the, the disadvantages, of course, of the video are that you know, most of the participants look to be about four inches tall on the TV, no matter how large a TV screen you've got in your courtroom, and you don't completely get to see all of the nuances of how they're reacting to an incentive or a sanction, as you can see when you have them right there in front of you in person. Nonetheless, I think the advantages of being able to have at least bi-weekly court sessions with participants in those beginning stages of the program far outweigh the disadvantages that seeing them on the television um, provides. Uh, because of those disadvantages, however, I try to schedule my um, location so that I am not always in the same place and that I try at least once a month or every other month to be in the other location so that I do get the opportunity to see people face to face and to, to feel as if I know them some. So that's what we've done in our judicial district and it really has enabled us to be able to have the treatment court that we otherwise wouldn't have been um, able to implement. Great, thank you both. Um, we're going to move on. Our next challenge is maintaining confidentiality. This this uh, issue raises its ugly head every so often, and um, I'm going to ask Judge Britt to uh, start to comment on the confidentiality issues. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, confidentiality is a real issue in every treatment program, not just rural programs, but Maintaining confidentiality can be a real problem for someone living in a rural community. Um, it's difficult to, to make a trip to the grocery store uh, in rural Missouri or rural America, I suppose, uh, without running into someone either in the program or a relative of someone in the program or someone who knows someone in the program. And they always want to talk about uh, how they're doing, and you as a professional obviously can't really participate in that conversation. You have to be very careful uh, to protect uh, the integrity of the program and the confidentiality of the participants. Uh, we, we wish, we want our participants to, to feel confident that we are uh, respecting them and not out in the community sharing that information uh, with everyone we meet. Uh, secondarily, uh, we need to make sure we need to be very assertive uh, as a drug court staff, uh, as a drug court, about um, training and informing our 
staff members as well as the participants uh, about the issues and then what you know, possible sanctions for violating federal confidentiality laws. Um, those can be pretty severe, uh, especially for treatment professionals uh, as well as individuals. So we need to make sure that that we hold each other accountable, uh, much like we tell our participants to hold one another accountable in their recovery. Uh, we need to hold each other accountable. We need to remind each other uh, periodically as uh, as staff that it's extremely important for us to respect the confidentiality of our participants uh, and the program. Uh, otherwise, uh, we run not only personal risks, but risks that our participants won't fully engage in the process uh, and therefore won't benefit from the treatment we're trying to provide to them. Uh, we have to set the ground rules early on uh, and enforce them, and not only against uh, our own staff, but against participants as well. We need to make sure participants understand that what's, what's shared in group needs to stay in group because it can clearly create very difficult uh, group dynamic when there's problems with sharing that information um, beyond the group room. So uh, I think that it's very important for us to uh, maintain integrity in our program by maintaining that confidentiality. Great. Thank you, Judge Britt. Uh, in case you're not familiar with uh, CFR Part 2 Federal Confidentiality Regulations, you might consider looking at the NADCP bench book or the Legal Action Center out of New York it has some good documents that are easily read and understood. Um, you might go online and check with them as well. Our next challenge is the provision of training for drug court team members. Uh, and quite frankly, I think it's uh, no longer um, a problem and everybody uh, should be able to access uh, training now for drug court team members. Um, we've got nearly 3,000 drug courts across the country, and uh, it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, we don't have to any longer travel long distances for training, uh, especially now that we have uh, uh, laptops and computers and access over the web. Uh, there are some really, really good resources for developing uh, drug court information and understanding uh, over the internet. And the first one I'll mention is the New York City-based Center for Court Innovation uh, that has support from the Bureau of Justice to develop online learning courses. And uh, I think it's hard to read, maybe it might be hard to read that uh, URL that's up there, but if you'll go to drugcourtonline.org, you will find the Center for Court Innovation and their online learning system. Uh, it is remote learning that has become quite common and very effective. The center has gone to great lengths to assure that these course offerings are not just uh, metropolitan and uh, urban oriented, but they have done some uh, very extensive uh, work with rural drug courts, including Judge Bidegary's uh, drug court out in Sydney, Montana. Uh, the center's online training offerings include uh, video lessons from national experts on the following topics, understanding drug use and addiction, treatment modalities, cultural competency, essential components of a successful drug testing program, sanctions and incentives, confidentiality, uh, trauma-informed care responses for drug courts, legal representation of the non-citizen, maximizing participant interactions, um, prescription medication abuse, um, knowledge and skills for drug court practitioners, and changing the direction of methamphetamine addiction. So I would encourage you and your drug court team members to access the Center for Court Innovation. There is no cost involved, and they are excellent courses. Uh, they also provide testimonials and uh, tours of drug courts as part of this learning series. Another good source of distant online learning is the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, and they have at least four courses that can be accessed by drug court team members, including essential elements of drug courts, treating and supervising meth addicts, 
uh, transitioning new judges into drug court and law enforcement in drug court. All good courses that I would encourage you and your drug court team members to take advantage of. Additionally, there are numerous webinars covering a wide range of drug court relevant topics posted on websites, um, the National Drug Court Institute, the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Drug Court Technical Assistance Project at American University, which is what you are accessing right now, and the Tribal Law and Policy Institute out of uh, California also has webinars that you can access at their website. Uh, there's on-site technical assistance and training that's available through BJA's Drug Court uh, Technical Assistance Collaborative, which includes American University, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, and the Center for Court Innovation out of New York. Additional resources include the National Rural Institute on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, which meets annually for a week in Menominee, Wisconsin and the Department of Justice provides uh, drug court track scholarships. There are, I think, three drug court tracks now at the inst uh, Institute in Menominee. Children and Family Futures, a great resource for family drug courts. Uh, go to their website. The Tribal Law and Policy Institute also has a website. Um, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Drug Court, uh, uh, Family Court Judges, has a website and technical assistance and training available for juvenile drug courts. Uh, other resources include treatment improvement protocols, TIPS, which have been published for at least a decade uh, by uh, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. They are all online. There's over 50 of them. You can download them. They are very extensive and very well done. Um, regional addiction treatment and training centers also have websites and webinars and uh, state drug court associations and local colleges and universities. Are there other resources that panelists would like to include? All right, we're going to move to challenge number nine, providing resources and overcoming barriers for accurate alcohol and drug testing. And uh, Angela, do you want to start this discussion? Yes, I will. I mean, we all know we spend a lot of money on drug and alcohol testing for our drug court. Um, here in Missouri, we have contracted with what we call trackers, which many of them are off-duty law enforcement officers. They conduct home visits, curfew checks. Uh, they do breathalyzer tests and saliva tests in the home. And we've recently established standards for these trackers and also established another set of standards for testers or collectors here in Missouri. And if anyone wants copies of those standards, I'll be happy to send those out. But um, we know that anyone that's collecting drug tests, regarding, regardless of who it is, they must be done randomly and they must be observed or they're basically useless. Um, partnerships with your law enforcement, your probation, case managers, that's all crucial to back up um, your observation and always ensure that the appropriate gender is available to do the observations. Um, in some rural areas, just like ours, the saliva swabs are used to overcome those gender problems. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Angela. Anybody else want to comment on uh, better ways to do your analysis in rural areas? All right, we're going to move on to challenge number 10, uh, which is our last formal issue for today and includes assuring that our drug court participants have access to recovery-oriented systems of care during drug court and, more importantly, after drug court. We have to treat the disorder not as an acute disorder, but as a chronic disorder. Uh, the research is very clear about that. And you might want to access a webinar on the research to practice site of American University called Aftercare and Relapse Prevention. Uh, you can, uh, it's about an hour, a little over an hour long, and it's a good webinar on the subject. Um, my suggestions to, to, to you are to require a recovery management plan from each drug court participant before they enter the last phase of drug court. And, <laughs> excuse me, 
this is a management a recovery management plan that's developed by the client, not by the counselor. And it is a, a plan that is to serve them well beyond their graduation of drug court. And so it has to be owned by them. It has to be completed by them. There are formats available. We have one in Montana that we use. We would be glad to share it. Uh, it is the focal point for the last phase of drug court, for the judge from the bench, for the treatment uh, program, and for the drug court team. And so it's, it's an important document and uh, really serves well for the client as they leave and are prepared to leave uh, drug court and go out on, on their own. Um, support Recovery Month by encouraging the media to feature stories on people in recovery and graduates of drug court. Uh, recovery Month is in September. Support alcohol and drug-free social activities. Plan some uh, for, your, for your own drug court uh, with your own participants. Invite family members to drug court graduations, barbecues, and other sober, sober social events. Uh, support uh, alumni clubs of drug courts and alumni clubs of treatment programs. Uh, they help uh, substantially in maintaining people after they leave treatment and after they leave drug court. Provide support for recovery coaches and peer mentors, uh, a growing uh, cadre of people across the country who can help and volunteer their time to assist current drug court participants in progressing through the drug court process. Having been through it themselves, if they, if they are peer mentors uh, who have graduated drug court, is particularly important uh, for new people coming into drug court to see that it can be done and to hear from them how it is done. Uh, recovery management checkups, a very important uh, growing Evidence-based practice, uh, if you look at the work of Chestnut Health Systems or Ch uh, Jim McKay at uh, University of Pennsylvania, you'll see that telephone checkups are extremely effective in helping people maintain their sobriety and their recovery. And we as drug courts need to take advantage of these evidence-based practices. It doesn't have to, have to take a lot of time and we can use mentors uh, and other volunteers to help do it. Uh, support alcohol and drug-free housing in each community. Um, the drug court assessment process should be global and include not only the individual but the family and significant others as well. I mentioned the family strength and needs assessment as an instrument that you might want to consider using in your own drug court. Um, include former participants who are in long-term recovery and community-based representatives of the recovery community on your drug court advisory board. Uh, we use a lot of mentors in veterans courts. It's a critical component of veterans courts. We ought to consider using it in all of our drug courts and train mentors in, uh, in how best to help people stay in recovery uh, that have graduated our drug courts. Provide opportunities for drug court staff to be involved in activities that address social stigma, and other forms of discrimination that are faced by our drug court graduates in recovery and by people with criminal records. Uh, encourage team members to attend open 12-step meetings. I think it's always good for us to know what's going on in AA and NA meetings in our communities. And refer family members to Al-Anon. Encourage family members and supporters of drug court participants to attend drug court sessions drug court meetings and outings and consult with them throughout the individual's participation in drug court. Lastly, encourage treatment and drug court staff to assess the community and help establish and maintain recovery-oriented supports. Let's see what is going on in our communities and what needs to happen there and help plan and implement uh, recovery supports for our drug court graduates. Uh, Caroline, let me turn things back over to you for other questions that have come up. Okay, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, all of the panelists. I think uh, we've really covered a tremendous amount, and I do want to reinforce the importance of the aftercare um, because it's uh, almost wasted if we put all the energy into the drug court and then once people leave, they have no support structure. So let me uh, turn. We have a number of questions. I'm going to turn the first one. I'm not sure who's in the best position to answer it, but... One of the primary challenges that I have encountered in rural communities 
is a lack of defense counsel on a consistent basis. Have any of the panelists been able to address this issue? Carolyn, this is Angie Plunkett, and I know we uh, have a judge here in Missouri that has a very rural drug court, and he approached the local bar and asked them to rotate attendance at their drug court. So they had uh, six local attorneys, so one of them would only have to attend every sixth week. Uh, it provided education to those attorneys, and it also increased their referrals from those attorneys that didn't understand what drug court was. That's, that's a, a, a great resource, the local bar. Has anybody else had any uh, other strategies that they found to be useful? Judge Bidegary, can you comment on your public defender out there and how you have utilized, I think, a, what, a contract out there? Certainly. In, in our state, the Office of State Public Defender has taken the position that it would not allow their public defenders to serve on drug courts that include DUI participants. So the way that we addressed it just for all of our drug courts was to do something similar to what they did in Missouri and approach the attorneys within the community and do an educational session about what the treatment court option is and got a volunteer with whom we now contract we find it really beneficial to have one single attorney be the defense attorney through all because the continuity that it provides and the ease of keeping that person educated and up to speed on the latest things. But we have um, we, we treat the person as an independent contractor and um, use donated funds to pay for his services. Okay, thank you. Here's another question about the teleconferencing. Does anyone know if there's been any research to support the use of teleconferencing in lieu of person-to-person -person contact with a judge? Um, has there been any review of whether it's as effective or not? Um, do any of the panelists have any experience with that? Or Jeff, would you be aware of that? I'm not aware of that. I know Scott Carlson, uh, the uh, statewide drug court coordinator who may be uh, attending this uh, video conference, has done some evaluation of uh, the video conferencing that they did out in Nebraska. Uh, I don't know if Angela uh, knows of any research in that area or not. Yes, in Missouri, uh, our Oscar research section did a study with the virtual counseling that we're using here, and uh, as far as retention in treatment, they found it was just as effective as, uh, as regular treatment. Thank you. Uh, another question. Could, Jeff, could you <clears throat> repeat the titles of the resources that deal with confidentiality? And I also want to add one more, and we have it on our website. It's... Uh, yeah. Applying drug yeah, yeah. court cons or applying uh, court issues to federal confidentiality provisions, and it was done a number of years ago, but it pretty much addresses 42 CFR. So that's one on our website. You can just word search it. And Jeff, do you want to give a couple of the other citations you mentioned? Yeah, uh, the first one I mentioned is the Drug Court Judicial Bench Book, which was published by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And I think if you go to their website, uh, you can either order it or download it. And there is a, a good section in there on confidentiality issues and uh, 42 uh, CFR Part 2. Uh, also, the Legal Action Center in New York um, has several publications uh, for treatment providers and others, uh, I have one that I'm holding right now called Confidentiality and Communication, a Guide to the Federal Drug and Alcohol Confidentiality Law, and HIPAA. And uh, the Legal Action Center is located on Weverly Place in New York, New York. They also have an office on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C., but I'm sure if you Google Legal Action Center, you'll be able to access their material. Yes, and the, the document I referenced was done by Rebecca Howland when she was with the Legal Action Center. Okay, Scott Carlson is on the webinar, and he confirmed what uh, 
Angie said about the results of the uh, teleconferencing uh, evaluation. So thank you. Um, okay, we have another question about drug testing. Have any courts used the opposite sex for drug testing when uh, for observation when the person that's doing the observation is a nurse? Is that a registered nurse? Does that issue come up with anybody? Okay, well, I guess um, it's an interesting issue, um, and maybe we'll, we'll, look, we'll look into it further and, and follow up. Uh, one of the questions that has, was sent in before the session was, what alternatives are there for accessing treatment when there are no treatment providers available? And another spin on this is, how can one get mental health services when mental health services are not available? Jeff, do you want to start with that suggestions and see if there's anyone else who has some well, anything to add? I, I, I yeah, I'll start with that. I, I really don't think you can do much if you have absolutely nothing available. Uh, we have, uh, as an example, a four-county district uh, on the border uh, of Canada and the U.S., um, and the treatment provider uh, comes out of Great Falls, Montana, which is not in the district, but they do come up uh, at least once a week, and they come up on the on the drug court date uh, so that they do group counseling before the staffing. They come into staffing, then they do uh, they come into court, and then after court they will hold one on one counseling sessions. So I I, I think you got to have some access to some level of outpatient treatment services, even if it comes from outside of your district. And that's, I guess, where we can take Judge Vitigary's suggestions about going to your legislature and if you have nothing there in your state, single state agency, and uh, and making a plea for coverage. Right. Uh, does anyone have anyone, any other panelists want to add anything? The only other thing I would say on, on, on mental health services is I, I think every state has every jurisdiction covered through a community mental health center that is funded through their state mental health agency. And so uh, it, it seems to me that you've got to find where that uh, community mental health center is located and meet with them and uh, try to convince them that they need to provide some resources for your uh, drug court participants in the, in the mental health counseling area. And Jeff, you mentioned before on one of the slides that there's a federal um, a federal resource center, treatment resource well, center in every... The, the uh, new uh, um, uh, uh, Health Care Act uh, provides uh, funding and focuses on federally qualified health clinics, which are uh, neighborhood health clinics. And um, they have to provide uh, substance abuse and mental health services. So that's the other uh, new resource that we've got to start looking toward is the federally qualified health centers and bringing them on board with what drug courts are and the services that we need through people that are insured either through Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act. Uh, because the federally qualified health centers are a critical component of the ACA. Okay, and how can we find where these are? Is there an, an umbrella agency that would be having a directory of them? Well, it's different in each state, unfortunately. So I think you've got to find out who, um, you know, who the is working the exchanges. I think if you go online and you look at the Affordable Care Act and try and find what agencies have been given money for what are called navigators. Navigators are there to help people uh, work through getting their insurance through the Affordable Care Act. And they also have, because uh, I got one from my one of the navigators in my state, a list of the federally qualified health centers. So you got to track it down. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. 
And I if I can add a question, this is Angie, and um, I know in Missouri we have community mental health liaisons throughout the state that covers the entire state. They all have regions that they cover, and that's to link um, participants or just people on probation with the court system and with law enforcement and any other mental health um, resources that they may have access to. And Angie, what agency are they under? In other words, how would someone find out if they have those resources in their state? In Missouri, it's listed under the Community Mental Health Coalition. Okay. Caroline, this is Philip. Uh, you, you can also uh, access the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Service Administration, and you can put in your address uh, or you can search by state for uh, federally qualified health centers. Okay. We're going to try to put this together and, and send everybody a, a list of some of these suggestions. So hopefully it will be of some help. Okay, here's just a question. Like just like yes. there's a single, just like there's a single state agency for alcohol and drug abuse prevention and treatment, there is also somewhere in the bureaucracy at the state level a mental health single state agency. And so, uh, if you can't find something locally, you can go to the state mental health agency, which is usually located in the public health and welfare agency, and uh, find out where the mental health services are in your locality from from those people. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's a question. What kinds of AOD services best lend themselves to a telemedicine approach? Maybe Angie could start on that. Um, well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. but yeah. just, <laughs> In other words, when you have these, these uh, telemedicine, uh, the telemedicine groups, are there, you know, are they for just general drug court groups, or are they do they focus on particular issues and, and clients? You know, I do think they have the groups broken out between, you know, if they have a DWI group or a drug court group. But um, other than that, the only other breakdown I believe that they may have would be maybe trauma-related breakdowns between maybe an all-female group or an all-male group. But uh, I can contact Preferred Family Health Care and ask that question. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Does any, do any of the other panelists have any thoughts about this? I don't, but you might, somebody might want to talk to Scott Carlson in Nebraska because he's had some good experience with that. Okay. And Scott is on this, uh, is on this webinar, but unfortunately he's not able to uh, join in, but maybe he'll send us a note. Um, another question. Is there any concern with the lack of confidenti about the lack of confidentiality if one is using Skype software or uh, tele any kind of teleconferencing? Have any of you run into anything of that nature? I know our local courts in Missouri have um, discussed confidentiality with the provider. Uh, my initial concern in the very beginning, coming from a probation and parole background, was how do you know that's actually the person who's sitting in front of the computer instead of mom or dad participating instead of uh, the actual client? So I. After we ha expressed those concerns, they did uh, implement something with a camera to ensure that it was the person actually participating. Interesting. Uh, anybody else have any experience or, or thoughts on that issue? This is Kathy Bidegary. Uh, we've had the situation where we've had that kind of service provided by Skype, so of course the person's face could be seen but the provider did have the participant sign off that there was really no guarantee of confidentiality because you can't control whether somebody could hack in somehow to the Skype conversation. Interesting. So you want to keep your discussion, I guess, uh, focused. Well, here's another question, which I know is not exactly specific for rural programs, but it's a, it's a very important one. And this is from one of our colleagues in Jamaica. What is a reasonable time frame to terminate a participant in the early phase of the program due to their inability to comply? And I'm going to ask Jeff to start that one. Well, uh, I, 
you know, I think you have to look at each individual uh, situation and determine um, whether it's, you know, whether the timing is, is right or not. I, I think you have to give treatment uh, an opportunity to work. And according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, you're not going to have an effect until uh, six months into treatment. And so uh, I think a lot of times we're, we're too eager to terminate people because they don't meet what Doug Marlowe calls distal behaviors, uh, which they are really quite incapable of meeting until we give them the skills and the knowledge uh, through treatment and the tools, you know, to meet uh, distal um, goals like staying clean and sober. And so uh, we have to focus initially on proximal kinds of goals, which are getting to meetings, uh, getting to treatment, coming to court, uh, things that, uh, that they have not done for a long time and are not used to doing, being on time and being at a certain place at a certain time. Uh, they've developed these drug dependency issues over many, many years, and we have to be patient and tolerant and give the process time to work. So I'm one, and I think uh, Doug Marlowe and others are, uh, are ones that think it takes longer and we should give more time uh, to, uh, to this issue than we do in a lot of cases. Uh, different people, you know, progress at different speeds, and we have to realize that. We have to use progressive sanctions and not immediately start using jail for drug use. I think that's one of the biggest problems, particularly in rural areas, because we don't always have the resources uh, for a variety of progressive sanctioning. And so uh, uh, that's the best I can tell you is be patient, be tolerant, use progressive sanctions, and don't be too quick to terminate people. Because when we terminate people, usually uh, it's for drug use, and these are the people that need us the most and need us to be there uh, for the longest time period. Well, thank you, Jeff. And that really is something that we're trying to promote, um, to re redesign the treatment, you can see what needs to be done, but to try to keep people in treatment long enough so that then some of the benefits of the drug court can, can work out. Well, we're just about out of time. So we want to talk about uh, the follow-up um, we're going to have a, as I mentioned, we were going, we want people to stay connected, and uh, we want to have a, we're going to have a listserv. We can have other web meetings. We have the capability to have many more people involved than we had today uh, in terms of being able to participate. So please um, send us if you're interested in participating. Send us your contact information to uh, justice at american. edu, and we will then compile a listserv and uh, and follow up uh, so that we can continue information exchange, perhaps on specific topics and specific, perhaps in different venues. Um, I want to thank everyone for their participation. Uh, this has been a very exciting session, and thank Jeff and all of the panelists for your time and, and developing the slides and the uh, focus on the issues. And we hope you'll take a look at the treatment guide that we've developed. Send us any suggestions you have for uh, revision, and that will be out next next month. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and I think that we will be signing off uh, now from this webinar. Thank you. <laughs>